Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about a concept that I have worked on for years and I've learned myself the hard way. It's called the Lean DevOps Playbook. It's a way to make sure that you start from a success from day one. My name is Aman Sharma. I'll be your host and I'll be talking through this talk track. I've been a serial tech entrepreneur uh, doing my fourth startup right now. And I have given over dozens, four dozens of talks all over the globe internationally. And I'm also a startup advisor. I love helping startups and helping them scale from zero to one. Currently, I'm co-founder and CTO of Lematic.ai, which is a low-code platform, a low-code managed platform to integrate LLMs into your production-ready apps. And I'm also an AI and data lead at 84,000 Global Initiative. These are my socials. If anybody of you would like to connect with me, ask me any questions, jump into a brainstorming sessions, I love doing all of that. I also write a newsletter called is Build and Scale Fast, which is a way to learn how to use different tools and techniques to build startup from zero to one fast just distilling all my learnings that i have acquired over the last few years and sharing it with you all all right so i want to start with a small question i know i cannot see your responses but i would still love to see how you react to these questions and does any of these questions relate with you so what does doing four startups doing 20 plus projects and doing thousand plus deployment really keep you some of you might be saying experience, some of you might be saying a lot of exposure, some of you might be saying learnings, a lot of you might be thinking headaches, scars. Yes, if you are the one that answered scar, then you then we are in the same category, right? Like, you know, deploying all these apps could be really tough. Sometimes production things don't go right. Sometimes deployment don't happen on time. Sometimes the build fails. Sometimes there are security vulnerabilities on the platform. Sometimes there is DDoS attack and whatnot. And everything comes down to the core principle of DevOps, right? And uh, that's what we are here to talk about. So we are here to talk about the challenges that are associated with the current DevOps practices. How does Lean DevOps solves it? What is the Lean DevOps cycle? What are the different tools that you can use in Lean DevOps cycle? So this talk is going to be really, really tools heavy because I always love giving away tools and techniques that I've used myself. And finally, what are some of the best practices that all of us can use in order to make sure that Lean DevOps uh, works as efficiently as possible? So let's dive straight in with our very old CI/CD cycle, DevOps cycle, right? This is the holy grail of the current software industry. Very beautifully designed with all the steps clearly written and it's just flowing like water, right? Um, well, nothing wrong with that, right? Let's take a step back. Let me talk about a video game that some of you might have known, right? Like, can anybody guess what the name of this game is? So this game is called The Hill Climb Racing. The objective of the game is to go as far as possible, collecting these jerry cans as fuel and then increasing and extending a runway. But Aman, why are you talking about this in this talk? Um, well, we'll come back to that in just a second. I want to mention that there is one special thing about startups that is the key to success. That is being agile, as much as agile as possible, being as much as cheap as possible, so nothing too expensive that you're spending, and being as lean as possible. These three are the driving forces and the striving principles of a startup. And hence, things that might work for a big and large corporation might not work for a startup. It's like comparing elephants with horses, where a startup needs really a horse, but you're offering it a battle tested elephant, which it might not really need a use of or might not really fit in its use case, right? Well, let's come back to the game, video game that we were talking about. That is the hill climb racing video game, right? So how does this really relates with the startup? Well, if you think metaphorically, there are a lot of analogies that we can draw in here. So imagine that the whole uh, startup is basically this video game, right? Your red car is the app. And the goal of the app is to acquire as many number of users, right? And to acquire those users, you are sprinting all the time, uh, which is when you hit, hit the sprint, you are reducing your runway and you have to acquire the next funding round so that you can go as farther as possible. So the balance continues, but sometimes you have to break as well to make sure that things remains balanced. And this break is basically the tech depth, which you uh, perform more or less often to make sure that, you know, your, your startups goes on smoothly. Well, this is a typical story of uh, a startup. 
And that's where the concept of the lean DevOps comes in. It's, it's combining the principles from the lean startup playbook and also the DevOps practices that exist today and how we can merge them together so that startups can survive this video game as long as possible. Where the main goal is just doing things as good as till the next funding cycle so that we can keep extending our runway, keep sprinting through, don't have a lot of tech debt and acquire as many number of users. That's the main key holy grail of this whole talk. Well, if you talk about this cycle, this really doesn't really applies to a lot of startups, right? There are no separate builds a startup is doing. There is just like one monolith app, more or less. You might have multiple small apps, but still it's not a lot that you have to have different build cycles. Uh, also, sometimes unit tests is, are not really built for startups, right? And uh, in terms of the release cycle, startups just need a simple on one-click deployment solution and they don't have a, large, a lot of large deployments. And so we are thinking about not having uh, Kubernetes, Ansible, Terraform, and stuff like that, right? It's really simple. The demands is really predictable. And even if it is going to increase, it's it's going to increase gradually. And when these demand of the users increases, the startup would have resources to balance them too, right? The goal of the initial time, the zero to one journey of a startup is to make sure that how they can burn as many money as possible. So there are a lot of elements in this CI CD cycle that don't really apply to an early stage startup. Agree? Well, Let's make this diagram a little better, right? A lot of things are getting messy. That's what the Lean DevOps cycle is about. It's a very simple six-step process to make sure that you and your team at a startup level deploy as fast as possible, as agile as possible, and as lean as possible. All the three principles that we discussed uh, in the start of this presentation. So there is plan, code, test, review, deploy, and observe, and the cycle keeps on repeating itself. Let's go through each one of these steps in the Lean DevOps cycles to understand them in great detail. The first step is plan. The goal of planning is to make sure that everything is transparent, in information is transparent. The planning is done in a very lean uh, fashion. It's not taxing where a lot of engineers are just creating a lot of Jira tickets and not actually getting any work done. It reduces the uh, importance of having a lot of meetings where everybody needs to come and do a stand up every day to make sure uh, you know everybody knows what's going on. So thinking about this and making sure that you only have two developer team, that is maybe your CEO or CTO and just one developer, how you can start with this planning process. So for the first important thing that I have learned is to have a very clear product roadmap. And I have found the Lean Product Playbook to be a great place to learn about how to build product roadmaps. It uses the Kano principle, which is dividing the different features by must-have performance and delighters, and then dividing them across different release cycles over different quarters. Also making sure that you know the dependency, what requires what, and then what kind of engineers and what kind of resources you would require at that particular time. Having a product roadmap like this, visible in front of all the engineers, makes everybody come together in situations where some more resources might be needed. And there is no ambiguity or finger pointing about this is not my job. Everybody knows what's going to happen at the startup. I have found Notion and Miro, the tool that I'm using to present this presentation as well, to be great tool uh, to make product roadmaps like this. Then the second step is execution after your product roadmap is complete. So use a method like Sprint. I used to use Notion earlier, which is my custom template, but I have started using Linear recently. I have spent quite good time and I highly recommend it. The goal of execution is that everything that you do is really well documented so that anybody can go back to an execution playlist and they can see what's actually uh, needs to be done and what is not in the criteria right now. And once that is done, assign it to a sprint. A sprint can last for two weeks or usually typically 25 story points. And average item is four story points. And make sure that you deliver those items in time. Instead of uh, like defining what things needs to be done, define when they need to be done and what are the scope of these items and try not to change these scopes as long as possible. And then uh, one thing I have found that the standups are really great. Uh, usually a weekly standup where you just have a fixed agenda where you're discussing uh, what are the things that you are uh, supposed to do and like just you know, uh, discuss what are the different follow-ups. What I really found great is that before the meeting, the memo should be ready so that everybody can get familiar with what needs to be done. And there is no wastage of time in order to clear priorities and what is the agenda of the talk. Next step is to actually start coding, right? 
the code really needs to follow four guidelines, which is being readable, being collaborative, being modular. That means it could be used by different system and it doesn't need to be spaghetti code, right? We all admire to be non-spaghetti code writers. And in that, I think the first important decision to make is a differentiation between following a monorepo structure or a polyrepo structure. For those of you who don't know polyrepo, monorepo is just simple hosting everything in different GitHub repositories. But polyrepo is where things just start getting really crazy. If you think that your app might evolve into different different uh, app components, you might have a web presence and you might have a mobile presence. You might have a web presence using a different different uh, client uh, touch points, and you might share some component across. Then you might be uh, interested in looking into what Polyrepo really does. So what Polyrepo does is like you have different apps which are all hosted in the same GitHub repository. So they all have the same build cycles, but uh, Polyrepo manager in this case, NX decides what needs to be built and it like smartly adjusts and builds only the things that actually change in the production. I won't go too deep into this, but it's really something that you should spend a little bit of energy on just trying to learn what this really, this really does. The next thing is following a code structure. And I think not planning the code structure in a very hard way, but just being aware of it makes uh, things a lot different. I've used tools like Code C a lot uh, in my like you know career journey, and I found these to be great tool to really see how things are really mending up. It also improves the onboarding process of onboarding any new engineers. They can really visually see uh, how the code really behaves, how does it connect to different components, and then they can plan accordingly. The next thing is to have maintainability record from the day one. See how things are evolving. See how the code maintainability is changing over time and never let it go out of laps over a long period of time. Because it's easy to say that let's just develop a software right now and think about technical depth later, but it really gets weird uh, in the later stages of the startup. So let's not get to that point, right? Then also make sure that the security is really great at uh, from the day one. I have used static analysis tools like SNCC, which comes at no cost, which helps you analyze your code uh, and all automatically connects with your whole CI CD pipeline and pull requests uh, to make sure that you don't have any security vulnerabilities in day one. These things are very easy to manage during the deployment process or the merge process itself instead of doing a pro post op of finding what's wrong with our system. Now, once your uh, app has been built, uh, the coded, uh, the next step is of course testing it, right? And the goal of testing is to have a quick way to test things. It needs to be really qualitative instead of just number or uh, how much test cases you are passing. Uh, it needs to be automated as much as possible because a startup really doesn't afford a tester or a QA person more, more often. And then it doesn't need to be slow. It doesn't need to drag the whole process down. I found that static analysis are really good tool to just have a sense of awareness of how good the code is. You can use tools like Deep Source and Code Climate that just directly connects with your uh, CI/CD pipeline, and they would just analyze the code and let the developer know on, uh, on directly that uh, how they can improve their code. This could include different linting practices, different code practices, different uh, you know code complexities issues. And all these comes together to make sure that your code is really healthy. And same thing that we talked before as well, apply security checks directly at the merge uh, or the build phase itself so that your code can be analyzed. And if there is any vulnerability, the engineers can fix it right away, right, right at that time. And I've also found, and I might be biased and opinionated here, that sometimes unit tests are not for startups. Uh, well, unit tests are proving that they are actually dragging you down. You are not focusing on building actual apps, but building unit tests. And there was a report from Forbes that said that uh, unit test is the enemy of startup agility. It's much better to rely on a better end-to-end -end process, uh, for example, Cypress and test project, uh, to make sure that the end user experience is what is amazing, not the internal dynamics of how your app really functions and what output it really does produce. Yes, for bigger companies, for uh, later stage startups, yes, you can consider unit test. But initially, I think it's a drag instead of help actually helping you improve a code quality. And I've also found that the end-to-end -to -end tools have got really better over the time, right? There are now uh, Gen AI-based end-to-end uh, -end testing tools like uh, Meticulous that I've personally used or Octomind, which are really great tools to uh, generate test cases without even writing even a single test case. 
Well, that's all about test. And once your test is complete, the next step is review, right? The goal of review is to have it accessible across different boards, different stakeholders can come together, review your code. It needs to be really collaborative in that way. It needs to be very short. It should not take months to just deploy and then get it reviewed by the designer or the stakeholder and then get back to the developer, ask for changes. It needs to be really short and iterative, right? And it doesn't need to be a manual drive cycle. Uh, in that situation, you also need to see what environment settings do you really use. I have found this tree-like skeleton structure that we call in uh, in GitHub branching system to be really great. You have a main master branch, you have a one staging branch, which is just directly synced with the main branch. And then there is dev branch where developers can test everything. And each task or each request uh, or each feature that the developer is just working on is an individual branch. Uh, if you're using systems like Linear, it really enforces on uh, following this methodology and then merging every feature as a pull request instead of merging the whole branch uh, as a sprint or a release that you are doing. So doing it by feature instead of release is a much, much better way to make sure that you are working on a very short iterative cycle. And uh, there is no better tool that I've found than Vercel one-click deploy, or there are other tools now in this category as well that does this very well. With each pull request, you get uh, like a preview link which you can share with different stakeholders and they can directly comment inside the UI of your app to make sure how things are looking. And then they can like, you know, create uh, comment blocks which will only resolve if that issue is resolved. And then it just works back and forth between the preview of your app and then uh, until those things are resolved, it doesn't go as far. After the review step is complete, the next step is the deploy, which sometimes is the hardest and the most challenging part. The goal of the deployment process is having quick, simple, scalable, and continuous development. Deployment. And as a startup level, CTO, uh, most more in, more in uh, the situation, just me, is the person who is responsible for deployment. And I have to make sure that these all principles are followed. I've always confused myself with different ways that I can deploy with apps, uh, deploy my apps. And ultimately, I think the simplest way to describe this is categorizing all the different deployment strategies into just three buckets. That is front-end, medium, and large. Let me tell you, explain you like what these different configuration really means. So front end means anything that is front end. And this is like a no brainer. Use a deployment tools like Vercel that directly connects with your GitHub and automatically deploys your uh, you know, code in, into production. If your team are small, then you are not really spending a lot on Vercel subscriptions and you don't need to worry about scalability because Vercel just scales with your uh, user demand. So that is a no brainer. The second thing is medium resource, which is more or less like your microservices or middleware services that you might be using. In such situations where you're connecting with Stripe, you might need to set up a middleware and that is directly connecting with your front-end app. For this, I have found things like a digital ocean apps or even Google app functions to be a great tools uh, for deployment. They just directly connect with the GitHub repository and automatically deploys your code there as well. Well, you can do the same thing in Vercel Edge functions as well, but I'm just giving different alternatives and different categorization of the tool. Ultimately, the final choice of the tool is totally yours. But what it really does is it takes the mental overhead and the mental load from the developer on thinking about how should I deploy this thing. And as we talked earlier, the scalability is really uh, predictable in situations for early stage startups. So every time you expect a little bit of more surge of users, just increase a little bit of RAM or CPU or just deploy one more a uh, copy of that same app and then put a load balancer among it. Using systems like DigitalOcean have proven for me at least to reduce that mental burden a lot. But in heavy situations where you have large deployment, then I think choosing Docker uh, and Docker Compose from day one is the right practice to do. It might seem like a little bit of overhead before actually going to production, but these things do save time. It's just one day setup. And after that, your developer will thank you because your their code just magically appears in 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 this uh, backend stock. Uh, what I have found, if you are developing a product that requires a global availability, is to use a uh, digital ocean Docker and also create different images for each droplet. So that every time you need to deploy a new location, you just copy that image and deploy it on any server node that you want. Uh, DigitalOcean just does it really well. I am not being sponsored by DigitalOcean. I'm just like a huge fanboy of how they have made things really simple for developers to just focus on what is their core uh, business function. 
After the deployment, now we are on the observe step, which is equally important as developing all the different cycle steps that we have seen. The goal of observation is to make it sure that it's transparent. Every engineer, every uh, developer in the team can access it. It's really simple to understand. There are no complicated uh, uh, you know, numbers or metrics that, that you're using. And it's unified. You, know, you, have, you can see the things that are happening both on the front end and back end, both on different stakeholder level at the same time. Uh, in terms of app performance, which is the front end performance, I have found Vercel uh, Analytics to be a great tool already uh, because it has something called as a real experience score, which is very high level score of telling you how your app is really functioning. And these tools are really helpful to see how your app is performing over different release cycles. I've also found LogRocket to be a great tool as well, which helps you see like how your app is loading in real time and how the client JavaScript or different different functions are loading in real time. You can just uh, see any sessions and then see corresponding JavaScript loading or network calls in in uh, in real time as well. So I love LogRocket LogRocket for that already. Then you have backend performance, which is uh, basically like managing your containers if you have. Uh, so for normal day-to-day -day backend code, New Relic is great. They provide great SDKs that you can just plug into your backend code and uh, you can take it from there. And you can also uh, use semi-text if you are deploying different, different Docker containers, which just listen to your different Docker containers and let you know what are the health and what are the different logs that are associated with your Docker containers. Uh, in terms of error tracking, you might have already guessed Sentry is the best tool to go in this situation. I found many times how Sentry has helped me to prioritize my issues, which I can directly assign to my developers, and then they can take it from there. So that cycle and the short iteration cycle of finding the most priorities, uh, most important errors, and then just reporting them and then taking it from there really makes the day better. And then finally, developer productivity is something that a lot of DevOps principles don't talk about. They just think of that as a different function. But I think it's really important to have developer productivity as part of the lean DevOps cycle as well. And in this situation, I have found Code Climate to be a great tool, which just tells you like how your developers are coming together. You're not really uh, oversighting them or micromanaging them, but kind of seeing like what are the things that are blocking them? What is making them more productive? And you can help them maybe do better job. I've also found uh, recently that there are other developer productivity tools as well that I'm not diving into this recently, but do some research and find out what is the best developer productivity tool as well. By the way, most of the tools that I mentioned have some sort of startup credits or start at a very free price. So this doesn't really cost you a lot. So that's all about Lean DevOps Cycle. I hope I was able to list it or you know, give you some insights. But just in case, if you are wondering that this was too much to comprehend, again, I have attached the links to the slides. This is not really a tutorial, but more or less like a playbook discussion. So feel free to go back to this mirror board and then go through different points if you want to uh, tally this and involve these best practices. But if we just want to take away five points from this presentation, what I have learned through the development of this whole Lean DevOps cycle is that, first of all, don't go for free stuff or even startup credits that will cost you later. I have done this stupid mistake of sometimes relying with AWS credits and not worrying about what resources I was using because everything was just so cheap that when the credit expired, the startup has to really get a huge dump on, on our AWS bills. So make sure that you are ready and you are seeing everything as a sunk cost from day one. Don't add everything that feels cool. A lot of tools I have discussed in this presentation are really bare minimum to just have the lean DevOps cycle get going. But whenever your friends or CTO friends suggest you, let's add this to the stack as well, question yourself, do you really need this or you're just like adding this to feel cool? Would you even go back to this tool and you would see if things are really working great or it's just because somebody said you? So always feel that need because with every added tool that you are adding, it brings more technical depth and overhead pressure. Simply, if you don't understand anything, don't add it to your stock stack. Involve everyone and don't do it alone. I have done this horrible mistake of just being a micromanaging CTO and doing all the lean DevOps cycle steps myself. And I have been uh, disappointed. I have disappointed myself a lot of times. So it's very important that you rely on your team share some best practices with them and also involve in the whole DevOps cycle as well. Then keep automating manual things. Every time you see something manual, which is deployment, test related or review related, make sure that you find a new tool that you can automate these things. Saving time is what saves money. 
And finally, review this whole step regularly. Just don't do it once and then call it a day, but review it every six months or so, or every time your startup hits another milestone and go back to this cycle and see how you can really improve it. Well, that's pretty much about this talk. I hope you really enjoyed it and I was able to deliver you some kind of key insights and some kind of uh, new best practices that you can take away, even a small tool or even a small practice that you were able to learn. That is, I think, worth attending the session. The slides is available through this QR code. You will be able to get the link as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to my email or my socials that are mentioned over here. Till then, thank you so much and have a great startup building experience. Bye-bye.